Um, but we're going to be talking about an uncommon love, the uncommon love of God. And before we dive into that, I want to make sure that we have our definition of uncommon set for the rest of this series. Because uncommon, if we say God's love is uncommon, we might get this idea that God's love is sparse. And that's not what we're saying. Right? It's not that God's love is something he only pours out a little bit here and there, and you better grab onto it while you can, otherwise you're going to get left behind. Right? It's like on Amazon, when it's like, you got one, only one left. Okay, there's only one left, but that's not the uncommon we're talking about. Right? The uncommon that we're going to use throughout this series is uncommon in the sense that it's different than the normal love that we experience. It's deeper, greater, wider, bigger, stronger, longer, faster, better, every er word you can think of than every type of love you can think of that you've experienced. Now I want to look at Acts chapter 17 that tells us a little bit about this love. We're going to start in verse 24. The God who made the world and everything in it is the Lord of heaven and earth and does not live in temples built by human hands. He's not served by human hands as if he needed anything. Rather, he himself gives everyone life and breath and everything else. From one man, he made all the nations that they should inhabit the whole earth. He marked out their appointed times in history and the boundaries of their lands. God did this so that they would seek him and perhaps reach out for him and find him, though he is not far from any one of us. And that last sentence helps us understand our uncommon definition, right? That love is not far from any one of us. But it is uncommon in the sense that it's unlike anything we've experienced before. Because even the deepest, most genuine love that we feel for our family and friends is shallow and conditional compared to the love that God has poured out on us, compared to his unconditional, uncommon love. And that's the love that we want to be chasing after. And like Herb said in this communion meditation, it's a choice. A choice to chase after this solution, to chase after this uncommon love. Now, why should we make that choice is the question that I want to answer this morning. And one part of that answer is the first thing on your bulletin, is that we thirst for God's uncommon love because it produces joy. We thirst for God's uncommon love because it produces joy. Now, Jesus explains this really well because he's Jesus in John chapter 15, starting in verse 9. He says, as the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Now remain in my love. If you keep my commands, you will remain in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commands and remain in his love. I have told you this so that you may, so that may joy be, oh my goodness, my joy may be made in you and that your joy may be made complete. My other command is this. Love each other as I have loved you. Now what Jesus is saying without stuttering in the original time he said this, is that the natural outflow of God's love into our life is joy, right? If we could do an equation, I know we don't want to think about math this morning, but I'm a youth minister, so you know it's going to be an easy equation. If you have (laughs) God's presence, God's love, plus getting closer to God equals joy. Right? Or a simple way to say it, you get closer to God, you get closer to joy. That's what Jesus is saying here. He's saying the natural product of a relationship with God as you get closer to him is joy. Again, we need to define our words here. Right? So there's, there's a word in psychology called operationalizing. And I love operationalizing. It's like my favorite thing. Because what it is, is taking a word and making sure that we all have the same definition of the word before we continue. And we're going to do that a lot because I like words. And the two words we're going to look at here are the difference between joy and happiness. Because if we read this and we see what Jesus says, and we say, okay, so I get closer to God, I'm going to be happy, right? Happiness is going to overflow in my life. If you leave here this morning thinking that, you're going to be disappointed pretty quickly. But why? Let's look into this. So the difference between joy and happiness, I think can be summarized like one of those weird SAT sentence things. I don't know if you remember the SATs. I don't even know if these are still on the SATs. I don't remember it from when I took it. But joy is to, I'm sorry, happiness is to satisfaction as joy is to contentment. 
Or for the math people, happiness equals satisfaction, joy equals contentment. But now we've introduced new words that we need to break down, and I'm excited. 